Well, thank you for being here. And if you're online, welcome as well. We hope you engage uh, in the discussion that's online um, and let us know your prayer requests. I want to start us off, as I've been lately, just with a reflective question. And how do you, how do I respond to change? How do we like it? <laughs> Not very well. Sometimes very well. Do we embrace the change as a new adventure? Or do we fight against it and refuse to accept what's happening? See, the other side of the question is this. Are you the one causing the change? Or is God causing the change? Because there's a difference in response on how you actually answer that. If you cause it, you're, you and me, we will take the path of least resistance and we're going to do what's most pleasing to us. But if God causes it, you will be in the center of his will, even if you're uncomfortable, but you'll have a peace throughout the process. And we learn to embrace the change. You see, the whole point is that wherever God is having you at in a season is to learn to embrace it. And we're going to learn about this through the apostles on growing where God plants you. It may not be the place where you want to be at this moment, but we have to learn if God has you there, you're there for a reason. I'm there for a reason. We are here for a reason, and it's understanding and growing even if you don't like the soil that you have been transplanted in. God has a purpose for you. How we answer the question will impact how we grow. Because if we're the ones always causing the change, we're always looking for better soil on the other side. But guess what? It will always fall short of your expectation. If God is causing the change, again, we're going to learn to be content and enjoy the soil that we are in for the season that you are in because we're in the will of God. So let's learn together on uh, what the apostles are doing as they have left one ministry area and they've gone into another one. So if you found your way to Acts 14, you can read overhead. It says, in Iconium, they entered the synagogue of the Jews together. Nothing new. This is what they're doing. And spoke in such a manner that a large number of the people believed, both of Jews and of Greeks. But the Jews who disbelieved stirred up the minds of the Gentiles and embittered them against the brethren. Therefore, they spent a long time there speaking boldly with reliance upon the Lord, who was testifying to the word of his grace, granting that signs and wonders be done by their hands. But the people of the city were divided. Some sided with the, with the Jews, some sided with the apostles. And when an attempt was made by both Gentiles and the Jews with their rulers to mistreat and stone them, they became aware of it and fled to the cities of Lyconia, Lystria, Derbe, and the surrounding region. And there they continued to preach the gospel. You see, we begin to see a pattern with Paul and Barnabas that they go to the Jew first. Paul talks about this in Romans. The messianic fulfillment is a fulfillment of biblical Judaism. So he goes to the Jew first. And then with that, he has the Gentiles, non-Hebrew, that have converted to Judaism. Some of them that are on the fence, they're God-fearers. They still fear Yahweh, but they are on the fence of converting to Judaism. And so the message always goes to the synagogue first. And if you notice the way Luke is recording this, he's not giving a lot of detail as he did in Luke chapter or Luke uh, Acts chapter 13. He's giving us a glimpse of what's going on. They go to the synagogue, they speak in such a manner, people are converted, people are believing. Because here's the kicker, when you and I practice sharing the gospel with people, the first time is the scariest time. The second time, still scary, just not as scary. Third time, okay, I can handle this, the fourth, the fifth. And you see in Acts 13, they're in a cyclical sermon uh, evangelism. Then they go to Sergius Paulus. Then they go to Pisidian Antioch. The more and more they open their mouth and share Jesus and invite people to follow him, the easier it gets. As in sharing, it doesn't mean that it's not going to be tough because you're going to encounter different people. But Luke immediately segues into what's going on, and he begins to focus upon their response. And we begin to learn something from the apostles just in the first few verses. 
that when you and I share the faith, when you and I embrace growing where God is planting us, sharing Jesus becomes easier as you and I do it. So if we're going to grow where God has planted us, we, we need to learn a few things. Number one, look for opportunities wherever God plants you. This sounds very similar to a sermon preached weeks ago upon maximizing opportunities to share Jesus. And it is very parallel because we see it the same thing in Scripture. It's nothing new. It's not a formula. Wherever God has you, maximize opportunities to share Jesus. If God has moved you to another location, another job, another career, another state, whatever it is, another church, maximize opportunities. Look for opportunities to share Jesus wherever God plants you. We see a similar pattern. This should be of no surprise. They flee Pisidian Antioch. They go to Iconium, and look what happens. They speak in such a manner that a large number of people believed. When the door closed at Pisidian Antioch, God opened another door. The apostles didn't close the door. And we as Christians need to be very sensitive if we're the ones closing the door and we feel led to go somewhere else, but that's not God blessed. We shut the door. We see the impossibility. We get uncomfortable. We sabotage. Then we look, oh, maybe look at, there's another, look at the soil over there. The soil's better over there. God never closed the door. God is growing you. And when you and I sabotage things, we'll go when God never sends us. But we notice with the pattern of the apostles, they stay. When it becomes tense, they don't pick up stakes and fold their tent and leave. They stay until there is persecution and then they move on. They didn't close the door. God closed the door. They didn't self-sabotage the opportunity of Pisidian Antioch. Pisidian Antioch pushed them out. But wherever they went, guess what they're doing? Sharing Jesus. When God transplanted them to now Iconium, and this is the southern Galatian region area, they just keep sharing Jesus. See, there's a pattern that we can learn from the apostles is that, number one, when things get tense, the initial reaction is for us to say, ah, that's it, I think Jesus is calling me somewhere else. And he may not be. He might be testing your faith. Will you follow him even if it gets uncomfortable? Well, I hope we do. The apostles do. Jesus did. We see through all throughout scripture. But we're going to learn how to discern, well, when is God calling us and when are we supposed to be transplanted? Because discerning that is going to be key if we're going to be in the will of God. You see, if the pattern was the same in Iconium as it was in uh, Cyprus, as it was in Jerusalem, as it was for all other synagogues, the head rabbi would invite a guest speaker, more than likely Paul, to speak a sermon. They didn't enforce their message. They weren't rude or aggressive about the message. And one key point that we can learn is that invitations to speak about what we believe are, are received better than forcing our beliefs. You can walk into a situation, they want nothing about, they don't want to hear anything about Jesus. They don't want to hear anything about Jesus. They're not even inviting you to speak, and you can try to force your way into the conversation, and you're just going to just be noise to them. But the synagogue invites people. We see this with the pattern of Jesus. He sits down, and Jesus gets invited to speak. Jesus did uh, two things. Number one, like John the Baptist, you can do a prophetic proclamation if you want to. Remember, prophecy is foretelling and foretelling. If it's forth telling, you're proclaiming the truth. John the Baptist did this publicly. It's a public announcement. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. John wasn't seeking to be invited to Herod's palace regardless of what the chosen presents. He wasn't seeking to be invited. He just proclaimed and then Herod had him arrested because Herod fell because he didn't like what he was saying. But Jesus also did the same thing publicly. But notice how Jesus moved relationally. He moved through intimate circles. And it's when the Pharisees invited him. That's when Jesus would give a teaching lesson. Jesus moved in intimate circles. We can do street evangelism, public announcement. It's biblical. 
We can do relational evangelism by personal invitation. Paul, Acts 17, he's invited to speak at the Areopagus. We see this through the pattern of the synagogue. He is invited and therefore his message is received better because he's not aggressive. He's not shoving it down their throat. He's finding a bridge for them to receive it. You see, speaking the truth of God's word is presenting both sin and grace. And I wish that we would do better as Christ followers of this. When we talk about Jesus, we tend to talk about the grace and the forgiveness of Christ. And amen for that. That's good news. But if they don't know the bad news, why is this good news? Don't deceive yourself to think that 45 and younger have any biblical uh, knowledge on a cultural Christian level. They don't. You're going to engage 45s, 35s, and younger generations that you assume know the story of Noah and the flood, and they don't. They don't. They're not raised in the church. But when we are invited to speak, we need to present both sin. Here's the bad news. We're born at war with God, that we've missed the mark. We're not perfect. So don't try to offset your karma because you can't. There is no karma. There is no reincarnation. But here's the good news. Instead of us reaching up to God, Jesus came down. God came down to live the life that we could and live to take upon himself the penalty that we could never pay so that you and I can be reconciled and made whole to God. It's not religion, man reaching up. It's relationship, God coming down. There is no other religion that even has this message. It's only Christianity. And when we're invited to speak, we can say, here's the bad news. But let me tell you the good news. See, the apostles knew the word, the gospel, and they also knew that God desires all people to be saved, regardless if you're reformed or non-reformed and predestination, non-predestination. If you look at 2 Peter 3, verse 9, the Lord is not slow about his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing for any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. Well, who's the called? I don't know. How about you and I go and witness to people, talk about Jesus, and let God sort out who the called is. Let God sort out who the elect is. That's not you and I to determine. But if we're invited to speak, our words are received better than if we're just trying to shove our way through it. You see, knowing the gospel, knowing that you're called to speak the truth in love compels the believer that we have a message to be shared. And this lines up with 2 Corinthians. Now all things are from God who reconciled, pay attention to that word, us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. Namely, that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them. And he has committed to us the word of reconciliation. Therefore, We are ambassadors for Christ as though God were making an appeal through who? Through us. We beg you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. The gospel is a message of reconciliation. That's taking two hostile parties that are at war with one another because someone did something wrong. And guess who that someone is? It's us. And it's bringing them together in restoration and in peace. Guess who that was and is? It's Jesus. We have the ministry of reconciliation. But notice what happens. People will choose to disbelieve. But the Jews who disbelieve stirred up the minds of the Gentiles and embittered them. When people hear the gospel, there is an intuitive, active human rebellion against the gospel our homeless team souls on the street, we were out uh, yesterday uh, driving around and uh, we encountered several people and praise God, we had uh, a relationship with a guy named Scott. We've been work- talking with him for a year, probably over a year. And as Dave and I were out there sharing with them and we just re- got right to the heart of the matter and Scott wanted to, he knew about Jesus. But I asked him, Scott, if you were to die today and stand before God, would you go to heaven or hell? He goes, how does anybody know? So we walked through and said, Scott, have you ever stolen anything? He goes, yeah, I've stolen a piece of candy when I was a kid. What does that make you if God says you shall not steal? Well, it makes me a thief. And we went through several other commandments. Have you ever taken the Lord's name in vain when you're angry? He goes, well, well yeah. God says, do not carry my name in vain. That makes you, uh, you know, a blasphemer. 
Have you ever been angry with somebody you wanted to give them wall-to-wall counseling and throttle them to the point to where they would just, he goes, well, yeah, everybody has. Jesus says, if you have hate for your brother in your heart, you've committed the act of murder. So what does that make you? He goes, that would make me a murderer. I said, Scott, by your own admission, you're a thief, you're a blasphemer, you're a murderer. These are three commandments out of 613. So when you stand before God, would you be guilty or not guilty? Well, of course I'd be guilty. So would you go to heaven or hell? Well, I would, I would definitely go to heaven. So, okay, so I missed something here. How would you go to heaven? Because God knows. I was like, Scott, what happens if I can tell you that God created you for a purpose? You're not a random accident by the universe. And that God paid the penalty for you so that you cannot pay this yourself. He did it and he's offering for you to follow him because the good news, your debt has been paid if you choose to place your faith in Jesus. Scott, do you want this? He said, absolutely, I want this. He knew about, but he didn't know. And so I led him through a prayer. There's no magic prayers. I said, Scott, this has to be genuine from you. This has to be between you and God. If you don't know what to say, I can lead you, but you have to pray this. And if it's genuine, the Bible says you are saved. If you confess with your mouth, believe in your heart. I was like, but it has to come from you. But then there was another guy that we we're talking with down the road. And he was believing in universal energy and all this other stuff. And it was interesting because we we're talking to another guy named Peace and his dog's name is Projects. And he's a religious person. And then another guy was overhearing. So we're talking with him and he wanted some information upon a shelter. He's in chemo for 12 hours. And so we're talking to this one. So we have one person that made a decision for, from what we can tell that was genuine upon the street. We had another one. He's like, well, all religions are the same thing. I don't really get bogged down with religion because they start so many wars and et cetera. This guy's over here hovering. He's listening. So we get done talking with peace. And then we go to this gentleman and he's just like, yeah, yeah, I'm a Christian. Yeah, I got the deity up there. Yeah. And I said, okay, well, let me boil this down. Who do you say who Jesus is? Let's cut through the religious garbage. Who is Jesus to you? Well, I was like, what if you were created with a purpose? What if I can introduce you to, he goes, you know what? Show me Jesus by giving me a place to stay and put a shelter over my head. Because if not, I'm just going to pray to the universal God of the energy. You guys are doing a great work. Thank you, but no, thank you. And he just walked away. I was like, well, I can direct you to where that is, but I'm here to share with a bag of food and everything. And then to share the message. And he's like, nope, I didn't take that as a personal insult. But when we share the gospel, it causes two reactions. One, people understand where they're at. Like, wow, I understand that I am a sinner in need of saving. The other one stands upon their own righteousness. Nope, I'm good. I got it. I can do it on my own. And it's people that reject the gospel that are full of bitterness and resentment, plant seeds of bitterness and resentment like we're seeing right here. But the Jews who chose to disbelieve, they rejected it. They stirred up the minds. And you and I need to be aware of this. You see, to disbelieve is to refuse to trust in what is being presented. It's not a lack of information. It's a heart condition. You can give all the information you want. You can heal people all that you want. And I believe God still does miracles today. I believe God still heals today. But that is not going to convert somebody. The Pharisees saw it. The Jews saw it. The Jews that chose to disbelieve in Jesus' ministry. And they saw the healing. They saw the feeding. They saw the lame walk. They saw the resurrection. And they still wanted more signs. It's not a sign. It's not a miracle issue. It's not a lack of information. It's a heart issue. And they chose to disbelieve in what you're presenting. Because that is their freedom to do so. See, the choice was made by the disbelievers. And they heard it, they saw lives change, and they reject it. When lives are being changed, they disbelieve. When addictions are broken, they disbelieve. When lost souls are saved, they disbelieve. When prodigals come home to the Lord, they disbelieve. When sinners repent and beat their chest, they disbelieve. If you don't believe me, turn to the words of Christ in Luke chapter 18. I want to read this quickly. 
Jesus is telling a parable to some people who trusted in themselves and they were righteous. Luke 18, verse 9. And they viewed others with contempt. Two men went into the temple to pray, one a Pharisee, the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood and, and was praying this to himself. God, I thank you that I am not like other people. Swindlers, excessively greedy people. I'm not like them. I'm not unjust. I'm not an adulterer or even like this tax collector. In fact, I fast twice a week. I pay tithes of all that I get. But the tax collector, standing from a distance away, was unwilling to lift up his eyes to heaven, but was beating his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner, the sinner. Jesus says, I tell you, this man went to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. It's not your religion. You can get your religion out of here. God doesn't care about your religion. God doesn't care about your braggadocious, arrogant, this is what I do, Lord, this is what I, I'm glad I'm not like that prostitute that's on the street. Mm. I'm glad I'm not like this homeless guy that's on the street that's drunk. Mm. Lord, this is what I do for you. And good. If we're Christians and Christ followers, we should be engaged in good deeds. That's what James tells us. That's what John tells us. That doesn't get you to heaven and nor does that win favor with God. It's a broken heart of humility that knows that you're a sinner in need of saving. That is what we are about. Religious people see all this taking place and they reject it. Nope, it's not information. It's a heart issue. Hebrews reminds us this way, take care, brethren. Let's pause there. So who's he talking to? The lost or the saved? It's the saved. Brothers. Brothers and sisters, it's a common. Brothers and sisters in the faith, take care that there not be in any one of you an evil and unbelieving heart that falls away from the living God. But encourage one another day after day, as long as it is still called today, so that none of you will be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. For we have become partakers of Christ if we hold fast the beginning of our assurance firm until the end. We've talked about this before. It's not how you start this race. You can start this race with Jesus or what you believe that you had a relationship with Jesus. It is how you finish the race is what counts. Paul says, don't get disqualified by running out of bounds. If you start the race with your faith in Jesus, make sure you finish the race with Jesus. And so many people are deceived. I said a magical prayer in VBS, or I said this because the pastor led me in a prayer, but they're not walking with Jesus. They are being disqualified, and that's between them and God. Well, pastor, can a person lose their faith, lose their salvation if you're genuine? No. Nobody can snatch you out of the Father's hand, and you're not big enough to jump out of the Father's hand. But so many people go through a rote prayer and there's no heart conviction or sincerity in it. But the pastor told me at a crusade, I can go ahead and walk down and I, no human being at all can determine a person's salvific status. We can encourage, we can lead, but that has to be between you and Jesus. That's it. Here's, here's a warning. Religious people see all this stuff going on. And they're just like, nope, God is not at work in there. Let's take a look at a key phrase, to stir and to embitter is to provoke. Plant seeds of bitterness and resentment, usually done by people full of bitterness and resentment. We need to be careful that we're not presenting stumbling blocks to people. Because Jesus says, ooh, he gives a warning. It'd be better if there's a millstone hung around your neck. Now, I don't thresh grain like the ancients did, but a millstone is like a concrete style stone that the donkey would pull around to crush the grain in there so they can, do it. so Jesus says, it's better that you take that, hang it on your neck and you be thrown into the depths of the sea than for you to cause one of these little ones to stumble who are trying to follow me. Whew. Oh, that's a warning. We need the warning. Let's not stir people and embitter them. Let's make sure our hearts are right with God. If words are seeds, what are you planting? If words are seeds, 
Seeds of encouragement. Seeds. We're going to talk about this more. If words are seeds, what are you planting in people? What are you planting in your spouse? What are you planting in your kids, in your relationships? What are you telling yourself what you can and can't do? Because if words are seeds, we're planting all the time. And guess what you're going to harvest? Whatever you're planting. Bitterness, resentment, anger, you name it. But another thing we got to take a look at is we got to be determined to grow wherever God plants you. We got to be determined to grow. So the tension is building. They're now going to uh, get, uh, people are rejecting. They're, in, they're stirring up the minds of the people. The city now in Iconium, not just in Pisidia and Antioch anymore. They're in a new city. The gospel is dividing. I need it. Thank you for sharing this. I hate it. It's not going to happen. Two responses. There you go. So do the apostles say, you know what? First sign of tension. Let's get out of here. I think God is closing the door here. No. Therefore, they spent a long time there speaking boldly with reliance upon who? The Lord. Wherever God is going to place you into a season, you have to rely upon the Lord to be there. It could be at your job. It could be in your family. It could be in workplace ministry. It could be everywhere that God leads you at the first sign of tension. We got to rely upon the Lord and trust his lead, not your own. And if the door has not closed, do not close it yourself because it's convenient for you in order for you to escape something so you can go somewhere else. If God has not shut the door, we're supposed to stand there and speak boldly and stand for Jesus. This is the apostles' reaction. Stuart Briscoe wrote a while ago, the qualifications of a pastor, and I would even say the qualification should extend to all believers, but he was talking about pastors. He says, the pastor must have the mind of a scholar, the heart of a child, and the height of a rhinoceros. The mind of a scholar is one who spends intentional time with Jesus and the word. I think we all could do that. The heart of a child means that they're sensitive to people. They're not hardened by their failures, not even their own failures. And the height of a rhinoceros is they're not easily offended. People are going to reject the fact that you're a Christ follower. If in fact you are a Christ follower. The church can model this. But notice what was going on. They're preaching. God is testifying to the word of his grace, granting that signs and wonders be done by their hands. God did miraculous things through the apostles' hands, through the disciples' hands. And did you notice that Barnabas is called an apostle? Did you notice that? That there is... um, Barnabas is commissioned along with Paul to be an apostle. And they were moving boldly. So I'm going to take my phone out here, not because I'm texting, but because, again, my, uh, my iPad doesn't like me for some reason. And I'm going to try to take the control over. But I may not work, so I'll have to have uh, Jose, if you wouldn't mind, turn to the, uh, to the Asbury slide. Many of you have been hearing about Asbury Revival, and if you haven't, let me actually go ahead and break it down to you. This started February 8th. It's been going on for 11 days. This is a place where it's a normal chapel service at Asbury, and I think it's a Wilmont, Kentucky, a small town. And then all of a sudden, people stayed after the chapel. People were beginning to talk with uh, the person that gave the sermon, and it wasn't any monumental sermon according to the president. And all of a sudden, it kept going throughout the night, and it kept going throughout the night. Social media blew this up. 11 days it's been going on. What you're seeing um, in the chapel was a snapshot from religiousnews.com. People from all over the nation are going to Asbury. Look at the line outside the chapel. The word is being preached. There is nothing fancy going on. NBC News has covered this. Fox News has covered this. Religious News has covered this. But guess what? You're not hearing about it. You're not hearing about it. Students are hungry, Nick Hall writes. Notice what the NBC News records. The first day we had a very ordinary service. I would call it unremarkable. 
said the university president, Dr. Kevin Brown, following a morning service on February 8th, a multicultural gospel choir sang on stage. Some students stuck around afterward, and by evening, more and more had trickled into the sanctuary, creating something special, said Brown. It has absolutely been social media that has the mechanism that the people found out about this, said Mark Whitworth, Asbury University Vice President of Communications. The setup is simple. No projector screens or high-tech integrations, just wooden sanctuary chairs filled with people and an open altar call with an invitation to prayer that still hasn't ended. Guess who's leading this revival? Generation Z. The generation that is written off as lazy, as unproductive, as wanting to be the manager of your business in the first month. This is the generation that is leading in an age of digital distraction, anxiety, suicide, depression, all the cultural things coming out. It's this generation that is leading the revival. It's still going on. So I kept an eye on it. There's people criticizing it. I respect this New Testament scholar. His name is Craig Keener. He said the university chapel seats about 1,500 and the seminary chapels seat about 1,000. And a local church are filled and lines are waiting outside. But what strikes me most is that even walking near the chapel or out on the street, it itself is filled with cars. I can feel the tangible presence of God. Nothing, something that, not something that can be manufactured. We would prayed for this to happen someday, but it is still way beyond my expectations. Right now, Asbury is still going on. People from all over the nation are flying there to see what is going on. It's being covered everywhere, and this is starting on other college campuses. So when we think that a generation is not worth the investment, this is them leading it. Do we have a heart and a hunger and a humility to be used by God where he, where he plants us? Where is your raspberry? Because I could tell you this, you can read the articles, you can watch the YouTube video link, it's live. It streams right into what's going on. People are coming and confessing their sins. Young generations are coming. People that are older, it is now becoming an attraction site where, yes, there's even wolves and prosperity preachers now wanting to go there as well. They can't stop that. But what they can do is boldly proclaim because their hearts are hungry and broken and they want to encounter Jesus. That's the revival. You cannot manufacture it. You cannot plan a date for it. What you can do is take that spark and you let it ignite everything in your life. And it spreads to other people. Because what this young generation and what people are wanting is sincerity and authenticity. They don't want religion. They want Jesus. And it's catching fire. And I pray to God that it catches here. But the people have to be hungry. The people have to be willing to be broken. Because when our leg is broken and it heals the wrong way, guess what a good doctor is going to do? He's going to re-break it and he's going to reset it. Because even though you're used to walking around like this, it still causes you pain, but you've numbed it out. And the doctor will set you straight. When this happens, people become divided as what the gospel does. People are being attracted to the apostles' message. Good people, bad people, wolves in sheep's clothing, sheep there. Everybody is going on. And it's dividing people. Some side with the Jews, others with the apostles. And here's something to remember. The message of Jesus attracts all people from all walks of life. It is not up for you and I to determine who is authentic and who is not authentic. It is up for you and I to be faithful to God because that's who we give an accounting to. And if we're sincere in our walk with Jesus, I, it spreads. When people see authentic Christianity, it's contagious. And people that are hungry, that are lost, that are looking for a savior. Hopefully they see it modeled in our lives. My last point here is that 
God may choose to replant you for other opportunities. He may choose to replant you. The tension is building. When they hear, when they hear about um, they're going to be persecuted and mistreated in verse 5, look at it, verse 6. They became aware of it and they fled. They became aware of it and they fled. <clears throat> the apostles were not concerned about we got to stand our ground no matter what. They were sensitive enough to their walk with Jesus that they knew when the time was ready to move that they would move. And that's okay because Paul had this view. If you look at 1 Corinthians 3, 6 through 7, he goes, I planted, Apollos watered, but God causes the growth. It's always this analogy of harvesting. Jesus says, lift up your eyes unto the field. It's wide unto harvest. People that are lost, people that are trying to find their identity and everything else. But Jesus says, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Pray to the Lord of the harvest to send workers to be in the field harvesting. And that's what we do. That's what we try. We try to encourage people to be in the field. Don't just study about being in the field. Actually get in the field. Because when the Son of Man returns, will he find people in the field harvesting? Or are they taking a siesta. They're not even in the field anymore. They can tell you all about the field, but they put their sickle down a long time ago. And they're actually just sitting on the sideline. If we look at the fruit of the Spirit in this, what Paul talks about, if words are seeds, and if seeds are being planted and growing, before the fruit of the Spirit can technically be the fruit of the Spirit, guess what it has to germinate from? seeds and when the world gives us all this issue of what is going on are we bearing forth the fruit that starts from the seed peace patience kindness goodness gentleness self-control love is that growing in our lives or are we harvesting weeds because we've been planting weeds or we've allowed other people to plant weeds into our lives Look at verse 7. So they leave. And what happens? They continue to preach the gospel. They didn't flee to be comfortable. They fled because Jesus says, when you receive persecution, shake the dust off your feet, move to the next area. Because people are hungry to hear the truth. We talked about that last week. And wherever God replanted them, look at what they're doing. They continue to share the message of Jesus. And here's my closing question. Are you willing to be led where God chooses to lead you? I want to have Josiah and Rita come back up. And we haven't done this often, but we're going to sing a closing song. We talked about Asbury. We talked about the revival. And there's people all over the spectrum criticizing it because they can't believe that this generation is actually authentic in doing it. So you look for scholars, you look for Baptists. The Baptist press has already written an article upon this showing what Baptists can learn from this. It's the fact that if this is behind, if God is behind this revival, there is nobody that's going to stop it. And it's going to spread. But you know what? If you and I want a revival that starts an awakening, it has to start with you first. It has to start with you and if it's going to spread into this church, it's when people come together with a heart and a conviction that says, I don't have all the answers, but I want to move forward with Jesus. That's when it starts. It may not be a monumental sermon. It may not be a monumental closing song. It's when the Holy Spirit grabs hold of your heart and he rattles it because he says, you're holding back on me. And if you want to live to the fullest, this is the time to make the decision. So as we... See